In the last video on economics, we explored a basic model of monopoly. It is based upon this idea that instead of producing while the willingness to pay of the marginal consumer is greater than your marginal cost to produce, you can produce until your marginal revenue is greater than your marginal cost. It is about maximizing profits, not finding a competitive price. This only applies if you are a price taker, not a price maker, such as a monopolist. Price makers have a curve representing their marginal revenue. However, this model has its discontents. I'm among them. The most important critique of this is the fact that it ignores opportunity costs. Remember, video notes will be in the description. Let's continue. James Buchanan is an influential Chicago school economist who wrote, among many things, Cost and Choice, which is his critique and view of economic theory. He also won a Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences for his work in economics of politics. We will come back to that in a future video when I get to political economy. But today I want to go over Buchanan's critique of real cost. To quote from his work, Cost and Choice, a source of confusion that runs through and sometimes dominates classical discussion of cost has not been mentioned. This is the notion of pain cost, often called real cost. Not content with searching for a predictive theory of exchange value, the classical writers sought to explain the emergence of value in some basic philosophical sense. The toil and trouble, the physical pain, involved in working, seem to justify the payment of wages. Observation revealed that capital also received payment. Hence, the concept of absistence developed by senior seem to place the capitalist alongside the wage earner as a recipient of justifiable rewards. The importance of this real cost doctrine in sowing confusion should not now be underestimated. Even today, the theory of comparative advantage, as taught by many sophisticated analysts, contains its manifest nonsense. Although, fortunately, little damage is done, cost does reflect pain and sacrifice. This is the elemental meaning of the word. But we must recognize that the linguistic problem which confronts economists is the use of the word cost to refer to quite separate things. Any opportunity within the range of possibility that must be foregone in order to select a preferred but mutually excluding alternative reflects costs. When it is sacrificed and its rejection must involve pain, despite the fact that differentially greater pleasure is promised by the enjoyment of the mutually exclusive alternative, Cost and pain are far from the being opposites. Contrary to what loose discussion often seems to suggest, the concept of cost as pain or sacrifice is and must be central to the idea of opportunity cost. In certain aspects of the classical treatment, the pain as sacrifice concept was understood. As mentioned, the cost of capital accumulation was discussed in terms of absistence. By abstaining from consuming, capital is allowed to accumulate. Clearly, this involves opportunity cost reasoning. For the most part, however, the real cost or pain cost notion in classical economists refers to something quite different. Pain also arises when nothing is sacrificed. In behavioral context, pain occurs as a result of a past chain of events. The utility of the individual is reduced without offsetting pleasures. The required outlay of labor must involve pain. Something can, within limits, be measured by sweat, muscle fatigue, and tears. The transfer of capital assets to meet a debt obligation to pay taxes or to pay tribute to a highwayman also involves pain, again, something that can be approximately measured by a decrement in net worth on the individual's balance sheet. In the second sense, the pain cost has no connection with deliberately sacrificed alternatives. The expectation of paying costs inform the comparison of alternative opportunities for choice. The realization of such pain is irrelevant in explaining or justifying value. This vital distinction between the two separate notions of paying costs was not recognized by the classical economists or by many of their successors. The roots of many modern ambiguities lie in the classical failure to note this distinction and a failure that neoclassical economists did not remove satisfactorily. To kind of illustrate what Buchanan is really getting at here, let's imagine that you just make chairs. Now, to make a chair, you need to spend $5 in material and an hour of your time. Your costs here are $5 and an hour of your time. That's something that you don't get back because this is what you're giving up to get a chair. Suppose someone comes along and offers you a job fishing where they pay you $5 per hour. So now, to produce a chair, you give up $5 in material plus one hour of your time. 
but also the opportunity to make $5 fishing. So in order to make the chair, you must sacrifice $10 and that hour. Now suppose that you also need to rest. The first hour of your work, the value of resting is only one cent, but this doubles, so the second hour is worth two cents, and the tenth hour is worth five dollars and twelve cents. Notice that your tenth hour of rest is worth five dollars and twelve cents to you, so you would never fish during or after that tenth hour because rest is more valuable to you. At the tenth hour, rest becomes a better alternative to making a chair than fishing, but before that, fishing is the best alternative to making a chair. So the cost of producing a chair changes at the tenth hour as your desire to rest grows. Now suppose you receive a royal grant of a monopoly to produce chairs. This means that you control the supply and thus the price of your chairs. While you may value chairs for your own personal use, the primary value to you would be in the value you can sell the chairs as a chair producer. Normally the price is set by supply and demand, where you are a price taker. Now that you are legally the only game in town, you can set prices however you see fit, since you had gotten that royal grant of monopoly. So let's just say that the market demand for chairs suggests that if only one chair is produced, someone will pay $99 for it. However, as more chairs are produced, in order to sell all of them, you need to lower the price by $1 per chair. This is just simply that. The more chairs you produce, it's a downward sloping demand curve. In order to get people to buy more, you have to lower the price. So using this, let's answer what is the cost of the fifth chair. So we have the materials. We're spending $5 in materials. Then we have the hour. Well, what is the hour worth to you? $5 for fishing. And then you have your rest, which is another way you could use the chairs, is worth 16 cents to you. However, a better alternative to fish, so $5. And then, since you've already produced four chairs, you are foregoing the revenue of those chairs. The opportunity of selling four chairs at $96. But now, you're trading that for the opportunity of selling those four chairs at $95, but it's $1 opportunity cost per chair that you've already produced. Thus, that's an additional $4 in costs, bringing our total cost up to $14 to make that fifth chair. What is the cost to make the tenth chair? Well, we still have that same $5 for materials. Now, in the tenth hour, it switches, so rest is our best use of alternative. So our rest is worth $5.12. That's how much money it's worth to rest that hour. And then, since we've produced nine other chairs, and we're foregoing $1 per chair, that's a $9 opportunity cost. This brings our total cost to produce the tenth chair up to $19.12. So, right here, I have made a Desmos demo to kind of show how we would represent this in our Monopoly model. So I did drew the previous, our marginal revenue curve, which is in green. We have our real cost, which is our blue curve, and then we have our red curve, which is our demand. But what I additionally added was this orange curve right here. And this orange curve is simply the opportunity cost in producing the next unit because you have to mark it down. So this opportunity cost is mathematically represented by the quantity, which is X, times the change in price. So we're losing the goods already produced times the loss in price. So that's an additional opportunity cost. Previously, our cost curve was below demand, but actually in this model, supply and demand meet because supply is understood to include the opportunity cost of marking down the unit. And so it's actually mathematically equivalent if you check out the math. So our verbal intuition, the basic example that I gave you earlier, which was a example in English, conforms to our mathematical understanding of the profit maximizing point. This confusion is cleared up of when we add this cost. It should be noted that we can't actually say social welfare is maximized if we ignore the opportunity cost of one party. So to demonstrate what I mean, you need to consider things other than the seen inputs and outputs of producing the next unit that we called real cost. You could argue that you should work until the marginal cost of calories burned while working is equal to the marginal benefit to your employer. That would not really be optimal. That is just working yourself to death. Lost revenue is an opportunity cost that has to factor into what people are giving up, what is socially optimal. 
The fact that it is not in the models, I personally believe, is a problem. So let me just uh, address some potential criticisms, which I think comes down to these two issues. We have the normative, which I think that people want to show that monopolies are bad. That does a very clear example to show harm that monopolies are doing. And I think the second point is that the subjective value only kicks in when you are the monopolist. And so from a normative perspective, it's like, okay, now that you're the monopolist, well, then this additional opportunity costs, like, well, from, from, the, from the privilege that stance that I have, which is a monopolist, this is my opportunity cost. And some people, you know, they don't think that's important. And also calculations. So opportunity profits are highly subjective. You need a nominal way to evaluate them, you know, the profits. Looking at profits in a nominal way as opposed to an opportunity way makes calculations a lot easier. There's that to consider. So that will be all. Despite these criticisms, we'll not be using any of what I just explained in any of my future videos. This is not taught in any of the Monopoly models, so it wouldn't have any. If you want to learn the principles, it will not be featured in really any of them. However, you should remember these ideas for later because I think they're very useful. And if you have any criticisms of this video, I, I really would like you to get in touch because I would really like to discuss this with more people to get more feedback on this intuition. Thank you very much for watching.